Hey, and welcome to video 5 of Writing Idiomatic Python, the video series that accompanies my book, Writing Idiomatic Python. Um, in video 5, we're really going to continue pretty much exactly where we left off with in video 4. Um, if you'll remember, video 4 was all about getting familiar with Flask and with database operations first through raw SQL using the SQLite 3 library, um, and later refactored to use uh, SQL Alchemy, by far the most popular Python ORM. So as you may recall from video four, this project that we're working on came as a request from a tutoring client. They wanted to do a very simple web application, the first they'd ever written. And to start, it, it would be eventually a help desk system, but to start, they wanted to be able to create a help ticket, uh, list all the tickets that had been created, and finally to view the details of an individual ticket. So here we have the where we left off at the end of video four, uh, the list of open tickets, and we can see that um, we do have the title uh, rather than the, uh, I think it was the change that was showing just useless information, um, and this green create ticket button. So if you recall, going back to the code, um, we have basically completed the list tickets function uh, and thus we have completed the default route. So the route with just slash. Uh, enter ticket is the, the way that we are actually going to create tickets via a HTML form is at the slash ticket endpoint. That hasn't been written. Um, for demonstration purposes in the last video, I showed that Flask if you return a string, we'll interpret that as raw HTML and return it uh, on any request uh, from a view function. And so if we actually go and hit the create ticket button, all we'll see is enter ticket in bold. So that's all well and good, but not very useful, of course. So what are we actually going to do when we say that we're gonna create a form for the user and allow them to uh, post information for a ticket? So it's a two-part process. The first part is to actually display the HTML form to the user, and that's the easy part. Um, it's something that is a bit tedious considering how many fields we have, um, and we'll see later. And then that's really because we're working with raw SQL and, and have to, we can't really programmatically generate this um, without doing more work than is really necessary. Uh, so the second part is once the user actually submits the form, and if you'll recall, when you are working with forms in, uh, when you're working with HTML forms, when you hit the submit button, uh, the content of the form, so the values that you've entered, are transmitted in a request to what's called the form's target attribute. Um, and that's just a URL that is expecting form data. And it can be sent in one of two ways, or using one of two HTTP methods, get or post. Um, post is universally agreed upon as kind of the better way um, because it makes proper use of the HTTP verb post. Get is supposed to be non-destructive uh, on the system, and, and that means no changes should be made as the result of a get call. Now, of course, if you're submitting a form, that means usually that something is being created and you are definitely changing the state of the system. Um, for a post, the system state is expected to be altered, so that's definitely more appropriate. And this is stuff that, you know, people figured out back in the early 90s. So uh, not groundbreaking, but very important to our implementation. So let's take a look back at the code. We can see that in enter ticket and for the ticket route, 
we define two methods, get and post. So that means that we will accept a HTTP request to slash ticket using either a get or a post, either the get or the post method. So the user needs to be able to differentiate, and we need to be able to differentiate between requesting a blank form for them to fill out and submitting a completed form for us to process. So how are we going to do that? Well, luckily, uh, Flask allows us to inspect the actual request using this request global. Uh, it's actually a thread local, but um, it, a global, essentially a global uh, variable. Um, and we'll delete this return because it's not useful at all. Um, but we can look and see what the HTTP method was that was sent on the request. So we can say if request method was get, then, and I'm just going to write pseudocode here, um, we're going to show form. Else, we're going to process form. Um, and obviously show form and process form don't exist at the moment um, and we probably will just write them in line anyway um, but it's instructive to, to see exactly how we're going to go about this so we need to show the form if the request method is get and all that really means is we need to display some static HTML um, if you'll remember from the previous um, video, we do that via the render template method, or function rather, um, that Flask provides. Um, and all we have to give it is the name of the HTML template that we want to show. And of course, any dynamic data that we want available in the template context. So. I went ahead and did some of the the grunt work, and it, it was uh, more than a little just <laughs> just to uh, get this edit page um, looking not terrible. Uh, so this is using Bootstrap 4, um, and it's really uh, heavy weight for a simple HTML form with a couple of fields, but. That aside, um, the only things that are of interest here are the first two lines, really. Um, so I made a small change to index.html, and we'll actually start there because I think it'll be clear from there um, what is going on. So you'll see these new line 13 and line 27 block content and end block content. So what Jinja2 allows you to do, Jinja2 is the template engine that Flask uses by default, um, is declare blocks of content or blocks of code that may be reusable um, and may be dynamically injected. So anything within the block is, so this code that's already within the block is the default value. Um, if, if no other, if this block isn't redefined, then this is the value that is displayed, and this is exactly what we had in the previous video. Um, but if we go back to the edit page, we can see that this extends line means that basically take index.html and include it here almost like copy paste, so it's almost like a, a C include statement. Um, the block content says, and where you find a block named content, so block is the keyword, content is just an identifier, I could have named it block foo, I could have named it, um, you know, fizzbuzz, whatever, um, but that's what we are looking forward to replace with lines 3 through 44. So the end result is that we don't violate the dry principle, which uh, shows up in the book a number of times. And that is just an acronym for don't repeat yourself. Uh, but it's a, a very important, if seemingly trivial, um, 
concept. And, and the reason is we could have written lines 1 through 12 um, and lines 28 through 34. Uh, we could have written them copy or copied and pasted them into edit.html and really it wouldn't have been that difficult uh, and it would have worked just fine. The problems start when we have to make changes to let's say the CDN URL changes for Bootstrap 4. It's not going to be an alpha forever. Um, so eventually we'll have to change this. Now that means we have to go in and change it. We have to remember to go in and change it in edit.html as well because it has just copied and pasted these values. Um, so as you can imagine, once you have, instead of two templates, once you have 10 or 100, uh, it becomes a burden to have to go through and make changes in every single place. Now what's more is more likely you're not going to remember to do it or you're not going to remember to do it everywhere or you're going to screw it up in just one of those hundred templates and you'll have no idea until something breaks and you're alerted. So the idea is that we don't want to repeat anything really if, if possible but code especially um, so in this case the code that we don't want to repeat is the header code and the script calls at the end uh, because that's just boilerplate and it's going to be the same for every page um, and we have a way of dynamically changing what is actually the meat of the page and so we'll go ahead and use that um, and just keep everything else the same. So, you know, this edit.html looks very clean. Um, if we go back and change the show form to actually be return render template edit.html and we don't have any anything to pass in dynamically um, and I'll just delete the else for now. But um, so if we do that and we run the, uh, it's already running. Um, so I'll just reload this, and lo and behold, we have a form that is appropriate for uh, creating a ticket in our system. Now, the things to note about the form, well, the HTML really is important really is not important. Um, this is every field that we've created. Um, the one thing to note in the HTML that is somewhat important is the um, action value. And If you remember I was saying that the action attribute for a form is the location that the data will be sent and in this case, it's the URL for the enter ticket function. So again, that's a Flask shortcut to say whatever the URL associated with this function is, put that in there. Uh, so that's slash ticket. So essentially the page that we're already on um, because slash ticket is what shows the form. But the key difference is when we, sub when we hit the submit button, it does a post rather than a get. So if we actually click this, we see view function didn't return a response. Um, and that's entirely expected because if we look at uh, enter ticket, if request.method is not get, which in this case it was post, um, we do nothing. We don't return anything. Um, and that's not valid in Flask. So it throws an error. So let's actually go through and, and do the work of processing the form uh, and handling that post request. Okay, so what is the post request actually going to contain? Well, it's going to contain data entered in the form and what do we have to do with that? Well, we have to extract that data and create a connection to the database just like we did in list tickets and then we have to execute an insert statement where we're 
giving each of the uh, values in the form as a value in the insert statement. So what we have to do is, is really just uh, the same thing uh, as lines 33 through 35, except what we'll be changing is the, instead of select star from ticket, we'll be saying insert into ticket values and then whatever we you know decide to um, enter as values so let's do that now um, and so you'll notice here that in the else clause I, I don't have a um, condition specified so in the if statement on 43 uh, we check the method is get but in 45 I don't check that the method is post and why don't I do that well if you look at the decorator for the function it says methods equals get post that means that flask will only accept requests with a get or a post as the HTTP method um, so I know that if it's not a get, it's got to be a post. If it, we try to send something else, like a patch or a put or a delete, um, it will return a um, method not allowed, HTTP error. Oh, look at that, a text message from my dad saying my alma mater CMU is being featured on 60 Minutes for some AI piece. That is fantastic. Thanks, Dad. Uh, anyway, so going back to uh, the else clause, um, we know it's a post, so what does that mean in terms of what we have to do for processing the form? Um, well, first we'll create a connection to the database. Connection, and you know what? I'm going to repeat myself, as I just told you all never to do. Um, and take these three lines because they're useful. Um, and so we can remove the select star from ticket um, and we'll instead say insert into ticket values. Um, and then we have to, so when you use an insert statement in this form, the values that you give have to line up with the columns as they were created in the database. So the first value has to be the ID, next the change, the title, description, all of that. Um, so we don't have the values, we don't have access to the values yet. So let's do that part. I'm just going to close that real quick and um, get the the actual uh, values from the form. So um, we will say, actually, you know what? Let's do this the proper way. Um, I'm going to extract this into a global variable. Um, so again, this is a uh, common idiom. Uh, when you have static data uh, that you don't expect to change, then extracting it into a global, and again, globals are um, signified with all caps. Uh, so insert statement. Uh, so this is gonna be a string that I'm going to interpolate with the values send in in the form using string dot format this will that'll that sentence will make sense in a second if it doesn't right now um, but this is really the the correct way to do um, what we're about to do which is create a, a big static string um, <clears throat> so I'm going to Um, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm pasting this from the end result because I really don't feel like typing this out. I know I would get something wrong, um, but not a huge 
deal. I mean, you guys can all figure out what I'm actually doing there. Um, so instead of um, writing out the HTML, or I'm sorry, instead of writing out the SQL, like we did in line 37 for list tickets, uh, we're going to essentially do the same thing, but call dot format on it. And now I have these placeholders for ID change title, each of the, you know, each of the fields that we have in the ticket table. Um, and so I have to supply values for each of them. So I'll say ID equals, and now this is the, the big reveal. How do we get data from the form? Well, if we go back to the form real quick, we can see that um, each of the inputs has an ID. Um, this one is helpfully called ID, uh, but change, title, description, so they exactly match what our column names are. That's helpful because we don't really have to think. Um, and I can just say request.form, and I'm going to use .get here, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but I'm just going to copy this, paste it a bunch of times. So change equals change title. This is one of those things where I really should use movie magic, uh, but I'm both too lazy and too inept. Um, so you didn't have to sit through me doing the edit.html page, but you do have to sit through me doing the each of the column names, which definitely could have been done ahead of time. Um, but you know what? It's a free video, so you get what you pay for. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, uh, we're just about done now. Okay, and why did I use get instead of the... Well, let's go back. So for request.form is a dictionary. Um, and it's not a regular dictionary because that would be too easy. Um, but we can treat it like one. Um, and so we could have used the, the index access or, uh, the, well, the um, index by key style. So request.form ID, for example. Why didn't I do that? Well, the problem is if you do that and it doesn't exist, it throws a exception, raises an exception. Um, get, obviously, if you if it doesn't exist, it, it just has none there. Now, which is the right way to do it in this case? I mean, you can make the case for we want to fail loudly, um, but you can also make the same case for maybe not all of these are required. Um, in fact, we know that some of them aren't required, and so we want null values. We don't really want to have to check if each of these values is null or not and figure out what to do in that case. Um, and so this is by far the easier method. Um, so really, that's basically the bulk of the work. Um, we do have to do something that we didn't have to do in the previous um, the, the list tickets function, which is we have to commit this. Um, so the, the cursor um, prepares the statement, uh, but it doesn't actually execute it until we call commit. Um, once we do, it's in the database. So we will then Um, we'll just redirect to the index page for now. Um, and we'll need to include redir uh, redirect and URL for. And they both work exactly the same. Or URL for just gives the URL for the index. Uh, I'm sorry, not index, list tickets. Um, the list tickets function. So basically saying redirect me to the URL for the list tickets function. 
which is exactly how it reads in English, and that's why Python is so great. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so we have now a what looks to be um, working method for entering data. So let's actually test it out and see. The one kind of not great part about this, well, there's a million not great parts about this, but the, the one that you'll see very quickly is we actually require that the user enters the ID, and we're using the ID as the primary key. It's just a number. Um, and it would be great if we got the database to generate the ID, but we didn't think that far ahead, and so we have to enter the ID ourselves. Um, so going back and actually starting the app again, um, we can, uh, I don't want to reset the form, I just want to show the form. Okay, so change ID, um, we'll make this three because I believe that um, the other two were one and two, change type, I think we said feature title, um, make me a form, submit her name, it's you know who, uh, we're not going to enter a file, we will enter a date, and we'll just use the handy date picker um, and choose today. So create ticket and there we go. We have our third ticket, make me a form. Um, while you guys were in the bathroom for the past 20 minutes, I, I did some movie magic. Um, so there was actually an error that was um, displayed the first time I clicked the create ticket button. And the reason was, and it's stupid, and that's why I'm not going through and actually showing how I debugged it, but um, instead of ID here, this had to be name so that it picked up the values correctly. Um, but that's the only thing that was changed. Um, so if we go back here, um, I'll remove all my debugging statements. Um, some of these will be useful, um, so actually I'll keep these in. And let me say, let me explain what I did here. So um, the form wasn't getting processed properly, um, and that's because the you know the there was no name for any of the input types, so nothing was actually getting sent. Um, but what I did was I changed the optional. Um, and the optional uh, fields in our uh, database to default to the word null, um, which in SQLite is basically the way that you say there is no value for this particular column. Um, and it will either just enter a null, or if we had, say, a default value, then it would use that. Um, so we'll keep this, but it's not strictly necessary if we're just, you know, good about entering all the values that we need. Um, but let's go back and now we see that, we see that we've got three, um, three different tickets now. So the last thing we haven't done is actually created the view the details of a ticket um, and for that you know we just said um, going back to the code um, we would just return view the, the the literal string view ticket and then the ticket id so the good news is that is ticket id 3 that we just created the bad news is it doesn't actually give us anything useful um, so instead of doing that what we'll do is return um, a, yet another um, HTML page that shows the details of a given ticket um, using um, a new template, which we'll call detail.html. 
So to do that, we'll have to look up the ticket based on the ID that we're given in the URL. So remember that we're going to slash ticket slash the integer ID um, and the view function takes a argument called ticket ID uh, which we have access to. Um, so all we really have to do is get that ticket from the database and make it available to a another HTML template that shows the details of um, the given ticket. So in this case I did not go through the process of making it all nice. Um, and in fact, I, I almost made it um, as as ugly as possible, but it, it will show you um, a somewhat interesting way to accomplish just printing out each field. Um, so because this is a tuple, remember, the, the ticket object that we're going to send in um, we can just iterate over it. It's a normal iterable and uh, for each field we can just print out its value as a string and that's it. Um, so we just have an unordered list. Uh, each element is the field um, so we're not going to have labels saying which field it is but again this is stuff that we could do but that wouldn't mean literally writing out every field name and then the associated number ticket dot what, whatever number that field was associated with. So rather than do that I just took the shortcut um, still using index.html, still extending index.html, still using the block concept um, but quick and dirty in the display of the data. So. Um, let's go back and actually put some useful stuff in here. Um, so again, we need a connection. SQL three dot connect. DB dot. I don't know why it's trying to complete that. Cursor equals dot cursor. You'll notice that this time I'm not copying and pasting for reasons that I can't really explain at the moment. Um, I'm a complicated person. What, what can I say? Uh, okay. Execute. So now we have to select the ticket that corresponds to ticket ID. So we'll say select star from ticket where ID equals and then we'll say ticket ID Uh, and this is new, so we're going to say cursor dot fetch, oop, not get, fetch one, uh, rather than fetch all, which we used in list tickets. Fetch one is when you know that there's going to be just a single result, or if you only want to fetch one result at a time. Um, and then we're going to return render template, detail dot html. And we'll say the ticket in the template is equal is is going to be what we pass in in whatever cursor dot fetch one returns, um, and that should be it for view ticket. So let's see if this actually works. Um, let's make sure the application is running, and we go back. Oh man, I cheated. So let's go, and lo and behold, when I click it, ticket three is there. You can see I cheated and did all this code ahead of time just to make sure it would work, um, because I'm tired of looking like a jackass that doesn't know what he's doing. Um, so anyway, um, we now have the detail page, um, and the, as far as functionality goes, that's all we were on the hook for. So we now have a system that, albeit in probably the worst way possible, um, d allows you to create a ticket um, and it uses all these newfangled HTML5 input types. Uh, so for example, if I didn't put something that looked like an email address and hit submit, it would yell at me 
uh, without me having to write any JavaScript validation. Uh, same thing with web website. Um, change ID is a number. You can't see this, but I'm typing a bunch of letters and they're not showing up uh, because it knows that that's a number. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's got a little, uh, a, a few niceties, but really it's, it's a steaming pile. Um, so we can, though, list all the tickets, create a ticket, and look at the um, details for a particular ticket. Um, and that's what we set out to do originally. So if we look at the code, um, we're now at 74 lines, and 23 of them are just comments, or the commented out, um, SQL that has been useful to refer to, but which we can certainly delete. Um, so that's 51 lines. Let's call it 50. I'm sure I could. Here, here we go. There. So in 50 lines, um, we've created, um, uh, you know, a very simple system, but a, a system that works nonetheless. So let's not, you know, be overly critical. This is a, a, an actual working web application in 50 lines of Python code and some poorly thrown together HTML. Now, what can we improve on this besides basically everything? Um, the fact that we have raw SQL is problematic and, it, and it's problematic for a number of reasons, but the biggest is it's just um, unwieldy and difficult to work with. Um, you can see like for um, the insert statement, rather than having this hard-coded string here, it would be nice if I could just um, refer to a ticket as an object instead of having to, to refer to the actual underlying database table ticket and knowing exactly the order of all the fields there. What I'd like to do is say, hey, I got this ticket class. Um, it has the following attributes. And if I set them, and then I say, call a method on ticket like save or commit, um, then you put it in the database and you do all the, the, the work of generating this. Um, and because I don't have to, I don't want to have to deal with that. And you know, when you think about it, it's not too much of a stretch to imagine writing such a class um, that w would be able to generate this programmatically. So, of course, if you can imagine it, somebody's already done it, and those people have done it uh, incredibly well. And so, SQL Alchemy is the ORM du jour. Um, and it's probably, I mean, it's definitely the most widely used Python ORM. And an ORM, I think we talked about in video four, but it bears repeating, is an object relation matcher where the, um, the object in question is um, the table, essentially, so ticket in our case, and what it does is it maps objects to database tables. Um, it can also handle things like relationships between tables, so foreign keys. Um, and actually it can handle the most ORMs that are worth their salt can handle almost anything. So anything you could do in SQL, you can do using an ORM. Some are easier to use than others, but regardless, it's definitely possible to do anything because at the end of the day you can always drop down into raw SQL if need be but heaven forbid that you'd actually have to do that so we have this working system here um, but it's definitely unwieldy and in the next video we definitely want to refactor this and see if we can turn 50 lines of um, much boilerplate into let's say 40 lines of um, SQL Alchemy style Flask 
simple web application. Um, and spoiler alert, yes, it's it's possible and, and it's easily done. Um, this video is a little shorter just because I wanted to separate or I want to separate the refactoring of this from um, the completion of it. So rather than say, okay, hey, we just finished this. Now let's refactor it right now. Um, I want to give everyone a chance to kind of take a look at what we did here and um, take some time to go over it and we'll do the refactoring in video six. So that being said, I hope you found this useful at least. Um, we do have this toy system that we wrote all the SQL by hand. We are now SQL wizards um, and we'll get into the two of my favorite topics um, that go hand in hand in the next video, uh, testing and refactoring. So look forward to that. Definitely look forward to, or definitely look for video six to come out in the very near future. And until then, this is Jeff Nupp for the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. Thank you all.